Hey, what's up everybody? This is Ray and welcome back to our beginner OpenGL ES and GL kit video tutorial series. In this part of this series, we're finally taking together everything we've learned to make a simple game. And in this part, you're finally gonna add some gameplay into the game. Here's what the app will look like when you finish this part of the series. So far, we've refactored the code to enable support for a scene graph. And we've also created a game scene that contains all of our objects. But right now, there's really no gameplay going on. The ball doesn't move, you can't move the paddle, you can't break bricks. That's what we're gonna take care of in this tutorial. And then there's one part left where we'll add the finishing touches to the game. There are four main things we're trying to accomplish in this section. The first thing is we want to be able to move the paddle based on the touches. Now there are different ways you can do this in 3D, but we're actually gonna do a very simple situation where we move the paddle based on a ratio, based on how far you're moving on the screen versus our screen size. It's not the most perfect way, but for this game, it works quite fine. Next, we want to move the ball, and we're gonna move this with velocity. If you've done any Cocos 2D or Sprite Kit programming, and you're used to creating velocities and making objects move by that, it's a similar behavior here, but just in 3D. Next, we're going to do some collision checking, and we're gonna do kind of the easiest possible way here, which is we're gonna make kind of a, it's kind of a hack almost. We're making a bounding box in 2D, and we're working mainly in this 2D plane, so we're checking if those bounding boxes in 2D collide or not. There's a better way to do this, and I would recommend using probably a 3D physics engine to get bounding boxes and things automatically because it's all built into that. And we have a tutorial on our website that takes this game and actually integrates a powerful 3D engine uh, to 3D physics engine to take care of this for you. But for simple purposes, this works fine. And the last step is we need some collision checking between the ball and the brick because when a ball hits a brick, we want to destroy it. We're gonna need an extra class for this part of the tutorial on the next one too, and it's called RWT Director. This is a singleton object that just contains some standard helper code and things we need in various places throughout our game. The main thing we need it for right here is we need it to store the view that we're working with because we're gonna need you to know the view so we can get the width and the height for the aspect ratio of the view. Later on, we'll be having extra methods in the director, such as some methods to play sounds or music. So here's the basic algorithm we're gonna be using to move the paddle based on touches. So we're basically gonna be mapping how much the paddle is dragged from the screen coordinates to our game coordinates, which is that 27 by 48 area. So we figure out that ratio, and if the user is dragging a certain amount in screen coordinates, we just multiply by that ratio to get it to how much we should move it in game coordinates. Now I mentioned this isn't perfect because, for example, our game is rotated, so actually we should be moving it uh, less in game coordinates if you're further up on the screen and more if you're on the bottom. But uh, we're only really, the paddle's only in one location and it's toward the bottom, so it, it works out okay for this game. But there's, there's better methods uh, for a more complicated game. All right, we have our project here where we left it off last time. As you can see, we have our game scene all set up. We have our bricks nicely rotating, a paddle and a ball, but if I click and drag on the screen, nothing happens. So we haven't implemented touch detection. The ball also doesn't move. There's basically no gameplay at all. So the first thing I wanna do is add some touch detection methods here. The basic strategy is the view controller is going to call methods on touches began, touches moved, touches ended on the main scene node. So the first thing we need to do is add some declarations for those methods onto the RW node class. So switching to RW node.h, I'm gonna go ahead and add some touch methods on here. And just like I did touches began, I'll also do touches moved and touches ended. Okay, so I'm gonna copy these three, move over to RW node.m. And at the bottom, I'm just gonna put some empty declarations here and we will override these on the scene class. Moving back to rwtviewcontroller.m, at the end of this file, now the view controller, when there's a touch inside the view controller, will automatically get called these methods. All we have to do is forward them on to the scene. Okay, so far so good. Now, switching over to the scene class, we can start overriding these methods there as well. Let me go back to RW node and copy them. Paste them here. 
Okay, so in touches began, the first thing we need to do is get one of the touches. And one way to do that is UI touch equals touches any object. Now we want to get the touch location inside the view. Now here's the tricky bit. For touch location and view, you need to give it a reference to the view that the touch is in. And we don't know what view the touch is in here because we're inside a game node. And what we need is a reference to the OpenGL view. So there's various ways we could pass this through, but we're going to do a simple way where we're going to have just a singleton object that keeps track of standard things we need to keep track of. And also we're going to have some methods in there later to play music and sound effects and so on like that. So I'm going to go here to my project folder and I'm going to create a new directory called director just to keep it organized. Drag that directory into my project. And now I have like an empty starting point. And I'm going to go ahead and create a new Objective-C class called RWT Director. And it's just going to be an NS object. And going to the header file here, right now it's just going to have a single 10 initializer here. And it's going to have a single property right now for the UI view. Switching over to the .m, we'll implement the singleton. And our initializer will be empty for now. And that's all we'll have for now. We'll be adding more stuff to this later. The important part is right now it's a singleton and it stores the UI view. So go into RWT view controller. When we set up the scene here, we will also set up the director. Okay, so now back here in RWT game scene, we can import the director. And finally, we can access the view here. Okay, so we have the touch location finally, and this is in screen coordinates. And what we need to do is convert this screen coordinates to game coordinates. And remember, I said we're going to do just a simple method for the purposes of this video tutorial where we're just going to base it based on the ratio. And like I said, it isn't exact because our screen is tilted, but for the purposes of this game, it's really fine. So we'll have a method here called touch location to game area. First thing we'll do is we'll get the ratio between the window area to the game area. And to get the actual x value. In other words, the game area x value, we just take the touch location dot x divided by the ratio we just calculated. And for the actual y, we base it based on uh, the ratio as well, but we have to subtract the height of the screen because the coordinate system is reversed. Okay, so now that we have this helper method, what I want to do is I want to convert this touch location to the game area location, and I want to store it in an instance variable for the previous touch location. So let me go up here and make a previous touch location, and down here we'll say previous touch location equals self touch location to game area, passing in the touch location. Now down here in touches move, this is the important part. So first thing is we want to get the current touch location. So it's going to be very similar to this, except uh, we're going to just, instead of storing a previous touch location, we'll just update touch location to that. So now we can calculate the diff between the old touch location and the current touch location. And we'll update the previous touch location since it's been updated now. And now, we know how much the touch has moved from last time, so we can update the paddle based on that difference. And we want to make sure we don't go beyond the bounds of the screen, so we've got to do a little bit of checking here. We don't want it to be less than the paddle width divided by 2, because it will be too far left. Similarly, we don't want it to be further than the paddle width minus the paddle width divided by 2. And then we finally update the position of the paddle based on this new x value. And uh, that's it. Now I can go ahead and run this. And check it out. As I drag, 
the paddle moves. Notice that it won't let me move it further than the edges of the screen here. So it's looking pretty good so far. Now let's go ahead and make it so that we can uh, make the ball move. So to do that, we're going to have a velocity, two velocity values actually, how much the ball is moving along the x-axis and how much the ball is moving along the y-axis. And in terms of coordinates, this is the units that we've decided for this game. Remember, we set up the units to be 27 by 48, I believe. Uh, so it's the units per second that it should be moving along both of these axes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to initialize these to be 10 each, uh, down here where I initialize the ball. And then we'll override the update method. And we have to call our super classes update with delta so that our children get updated as well. And then we need to figure out the new position for the ball based on its velocity. So that's simply the balls.position.x plus the ball velocity x times the delta time. And y is very similar, but we just use the y coordinates instead and the y velocity. The only thing is we have to do some checking here because if new x is less than zero, that means that it is it hit the left side of the screen. So if that happens, we just clamp it to zero. So we say new x equals zero, and we basically reverse the x velocity to make it bounce back the other way. And we have a similar case here if new y is less than zero. That would mean it's hit the bottom of the screen. So we make, the, make it bounce if that happens too. And then we got to check if new x is greater than basically the width of the game area. And we clamp it there and reverse the x velocity. And the last check, as you might guess, is checking if the new y is greater than the top of the game area. Okay, so now we have new x and new y, which have been clamped. So then we can say the new ball position is a vector 3 of new x, new y, and whatever the ball's current position is. So now if I run this, check it out. The ball is bouncing off the edges of the border here, just the way we want. And it will bounce off the bottom of the screen. But notice how it's not colliding with the boxes, and it's not colliding with the paddle yet. Let's start with the paddle, because that's a little bit simpler. So in order to determine whether the ball collides with the paddle, we need to know when the two are going to collide. And we're going to use a very simple way here, like I mentioned in the slides. We're just going to get a, a 2D bounding box of this, because we're really, even though it's a 3D app, we're really working in 2D here. In a real game, you'd probably want to use a physics engine or uh, a more complicated method of checking for collisions for, with 3D geometry, but this will work fine for this game. So I'm going to add a new method to our WT node here. It's going to be called bounding box with model view matrix. So we have to get the model view matrix which is going to be the parent model view matrix times R model matrix. And then we're going to figure out the low, lower left and lower upper right corner of this item here. So this is the lower left in our object coordinates, and we've got to convert that according to our matrix. And we want to follow a similar pattern for the upper right. Then finally, we generate a bounding box with this. So this method is really kind of a hack, but it works fine for um, our simple game here. So now that we have this bounding box method, we can go back to our game scene. And here we can get the bounding box of the ball and paddle. We'll pass identity through for both of these. And now that we have two bounding boxes, we can just check if they intersect with intersects rect. And if they intersect, we're just going to reverse the ball's y velocity so it bounces off the other direction. So now if I run, I've got to wait for the ball to hit back down. It bounces right off the paddle. 
So the only thing left for our simple gameplay is to check to see when the balls interact with the bricks. We're going to loop through all of our bricks here. And we get the rectangle for that brick. And we use CG rect intersects rect as before. Now, once we see that a ball has hit a brick, we need to keep track of the brick to destroy. We can't just delete it here because you can't modify an array while you're looping through it. So we'll delete it later. So we'll keep track of the brick to destroy here and just set it there. So if there's a brick to destroy, all we have to do is remove it from the children. That will make it effectively disappear from the screen because if it's not being rendered, you know, it's not there. We'll also remove it from our list of bricks. And of course, we'll make the ball switch its uh, direction as heading. Okay, now I go ahead and run. And check it out, it hit a brick and it got destroyed and let's hit another one. There we go. So we're actually starting to have a complete game. All right, that's it for this video tutorial. And as always, we'd like to leave you off the challenge. Your challenge is combined with the next section as well. So just keep on watching and then you'll be wrapped up. So I hope you enjoyed this video tutorial. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.